So up next, um, from what I have in my notes, is that we actually get a special visit to the Duke Lemur Center, and we're going to be joined by one of the team members there, I believe, Megan, and we're going to uh, learn a little bit more about what Duke is working on and what lemurs might be up to today. So looks like we've got our connection with Megan. Let's make sure we can hear her and we'll go from Hi. there. Sometimes it's adventurous out in the wild of North Carolina in the lemur sanctuary and lemur center. So we'll have to see if we can hear you okay. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can, um, that is a great mask. Is that, which lemur is that on your mask? These are cockerel shafak, and I'm gonna do a little plug. We actually made these masks. They're for sale online. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want your lemur mask, um, head over to the, <laughs> the Duke Lemur Center's website and you can uh, get one for yourself. So that, I mean, that's a great plug. You know, what better way to show your support for biodiversity than having some lemurs. So I know that we're gonna be going on a, my understanding is we're going on a tour through uh, the lemur center. Kind of, yeah. So actually we're gonna stay still and the lemurs are going to come to us. So I'm standing in the middle of one of our natural habitat enclosures. Um, so right now I'm just surrounded by North Carolina woods, but in just a few minutes, um, they're actually gonna be coming down here to eat their breakfast. So you're gonna get to see the lem oh. lemurs kind of in a more natural setting. Well, then I will make sure that we get to see it in its full, uh, its fullest possible way. So I will I will bow out and let you take over and uh, we'll wait and see the lemurs coming down for their, their morning breakfast. Sounds great. So uh, before the lemurs come down, I thought I would explain a little bit about what you're going to see today and who the Duke Lemur Center is, why there are lemurs in North Carolina, you know, basic questions like that. So uh, my name is Megan, I'm the Education Programs Manager here at the Duke Lemur Center. Um, and uh, most of that job is very boring, but the fun part of that job is teaching people about lemurs. And as I said, I'm in one of our natural habitat enclosures. This is actually number four of nine. We are on just about 100 acres here in Durham, North Carolina. And most of that is large patches of forest for the lemurs to roam around in. So this habitat is actually our largest. It's 13 acres in size. And we have two different species of lemur that are living in here. So we have a troop of ring-tailed lemurs and a troop of cockerel shafak. So you'll see this lemur um, and you'll see why they're designed kind of hopping forward with their hands up in the air. They're a very unique type of lemur. And the reason that I'm out here at this specific time is because these lemurs have 13 acres to roam around in and it would be very hard to find them if they weren't excited about their breakfast every morning. So of course they're in a forest, they're surrounded by food, but we still give them all of their favorite things and all of the most important parts of their diet every single morning. So we know every single morning, usually between 10 and 11 in the morning, that the lemurs are going to be coming to this feeding site and getting their breakfast. Um, another reason that we do that is because these lemurs have a lot of forest to roam in and we want to make sure they're okay. We want to make sure they didn't slip and fall or that somebody didn't get an injury or something like that and that everybody's still getting along because as animals that live in social groups, we know all too well, sometimes you get in a disagreement with your family member or your friends. And so this breakfast time is a time for us to check in and make sure everybody's feeling okay, everybody's getting along and that everybody's doing really well. So. Um, I also wanted to show you that I'm wearing a mask because we are still practicing uh, masking protocols with our lemurs. Um, all the evidence points to the fact that lemurs could contract COVID and there is no vaccine for lemurs as of right now. So everybody who's working here, everybody who's on site here at the Duke Lemur Center is wearing a mask at all times. But I know you didn't come here to see me. So as soon as the lemurs show up, I will flip the camera around so that you can focus on the lemurs instead. Um, and actually I'll flip the camera around right now not turn it off because I can hear them coming out. I can actually hear their caretaker coming out. So Liz is coming out and I can hear her shaking their food in their bowls and kind of clanging their bowls together. So that means, hey, it's breakfast time. And you're gonna see Liz coming down with the ringtail lemurs following her. It looks a lot like the Pied Piper folktale. So you can see the family of ringtail lemurs following 
The easiest way to see them is those black and white striped tails sticking up from the ground. They are moving around on the ground. The cockerel shafak will probably be up in the trees. They prefer trees. Oh, I just heard that the cockerel shafak might be uh, being a little stubborn this morning, so they may not come right out. That's okay, though. We can spend time with the ringtail lemurs instead. And I can practice pretending I know who's who. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna try to turn the camera slowly because I know it can be a little jarring with the connection here. And then I'll try to focus on the animals when I can. So I do know how to tell at least one of them apart because of what's called tail shaves. So some of the lemurs you'll notice have kind of uh, bare patches on their tails or short sections on their tails. That's on purpose. That's just a funny haircut for us to be able to tell who's who because in ring-tailed lemurs, like many other types of lemurs, all of them are about the same size and about the same coloration. So some lemurs are what's called sexually dichromatic. Um, the most uh, extreme example of that would be the blue-eyed black lemurs, where they all have blue eyes, but the males are black and the females are orange. So it's very easy to tell the boys and the girls apart. But for a lot of lemurs, like the ring-tailed lemurs, we don't have those easy clues. So we'll give the lemurs little funny haircuts that way we can tell them apart, and more importantly, researchers who come out here to observe them out in the woods can tell them apart as well. And I know Griselda has two tail shapes. That's the only one I remember. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, I was getting a breakdown of who's who, so we'll see if I can remember. Luckily, I'm not doing research this morning, so if I get it wrong, it's okay. Let me go see if I all right, so Liz is going to go see if she can get the cockerel shafak to join us, and we'll spend some time with the ring-tailed lemurs first thing. So right in front of us, I actually can't see the tails that well anyway, so we'll just say hi. Um, so we have two of our ring-tailed lemurs eating some lemur chow. So you can see that hunk of brown in their hand. That is actually a type of uh, primate food, just like a dog or a cat food would be made specially for those animals. This is a primate chow made specifically for old world primates. And that's a, that can include lemurs, at least in the diet that they require. It might also include other types of primates too. And then we usually supplement with other types of food. Of course, these guys are living out in the forest. So they have access to things like mulberries and blackberries that grow naturally here in North Carolina. And they also have access to lots of flowers and leaves to eat. So they're not as in need of extra supplements. Our lemurs who aren't able to free range in the forest, we bring them extra fruits and veggies and leaves to go along with all this chow because chow is kind of like eating a very nutritious oatmeal or granola bar. So it's fine, it's good for you, but it might be a little bit boring. So we make sure they have plenty of other things to eat as well. Let me see if I can move over. Here we go. Here's Griselda on the left. So you can see those shaves on her tail. Or it just looks like she's got little bald patches and she doesn't mind at all. And then over here, I think we have Liesl, maybe, if I remember, because Liesl had to shave in the middle of her tail. And then down here on the ground, we have Arias. And Arias is the male of the group, and he also has a yellow collar on. Now, that yellow collar can help me tell who's who but it also is a way for us to tell where Arrakis is. Arrakis is one of our oldest ranging lemurs. He's in his 20s and he's doing really, really well, but we always make sure that we have these tracking collars on some of the members of the troop. So that might include mom if she's the dominant female and everybody's hanging out with her. But in this case, we have it on Arrakis because he's an older male. And if he doesn't show up with the rest of the troop for breakfast, we want to make sure we can find him and make sure he's okay. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a 13 acre enclosure, which is a lot of land to cover if a lemur doesn't come to breakfast. Now what happens usually is all the lemurs show up and everything's fine. Occasionally, if we have kind of a chilly, rainy morning here, everybody's far more interested in snuggling up in a tree than coming down for breakfast when they're supposed to. So sometimes if we can't find them within an hour of their feeding time, we have to go out looking for them and we can use those radio collars to track using telemetry so it's a similar way that people track lemurs in the wild. And we can look and say, okay, we know they're somewhere in this patch of trees. So at least we can look up here and look for those stripey tails. 
up high up in the trees because they will go up 60 or even 80 feet up in the trees. So that collar is really, really helpful to know where to look. I mentioned lemurs in the wild. So I'll talk a little bit about where ring-tailed lemurs are from. Ring-tailed lemurs are from Madagascar. It is the fourth largest island in the world and it's off the coast of Africa. Madagascar is an incredibly important place for biodiversity. In fact, when you look at biodiversity hotspots in the world where you have lots and lots of endemic species, meaning species of plants and animals that are found there and nowhere else in the world, Madagascar is the hottest of those hotspots. They have lots of different species of all kinds of animals and plants. And in fact, if you look at all of the plants and animals on the island, about 60 to 70% are endemic and found nowhere else in the world, not even on mainland Africa, just 200 miles away across that um, channel of water. Oh, we're seeing some really good scent marking behavior from her right now. Ring-tailed lemurs have scent glands on their rear ends, so she was marking that tree as she was eating, doing a little bit of her activity with breakfast this morning. So ring-tailed lemurs are from the southern tip of Madagascar. They are from what's called the spiny desert region or the dry uh, forest. And so it's not a very hospitable region. And so ring-tailed lemurs are kind of general with what they eat. They are opportunistic eaters. So here they enjoy their diet of fruits and veggies and foraged things. And of course their chow biscuit. In the wild, if they get hungry enough, they're gonna start eating lots of weird things, including bugs, maybe even lizards, maybe even some other small vertebrate, but they're gonna eat their preferred diet of fruit and chow here. Although occasionally we do see them eating things like dragonflies or flies, maybe just for fun or a little supplement. So I'm gonna turn around a little slowly. We're gonna go see our cockerel shipwalk family. So they finally decided to join us for breakfast. Thank you, Liz, for getting them. All right, so I think I can at least tell who's who. Mm -hmm. And we've got uh, Marcus, and we've got Eustace with the short tail. That you can't see right now. Perfect, thank you. So it's it's been a while since I've been in this forest. Liz is helping me out. <laughs> so we have Rodalinda with the uh, collar on, the darker colored collar. She's closest to us right now. And then uh, we have Eustace, her son, with the orange collar. He's young and he's nearing adolescence. So he's got a collar on in case he decides to hang out separate from mom and dad someday. And then up higher, we have dad, Marcus. Dad is always at the bottom of the totem pole in the lemur troops. So Marcus got displaced by Rodalinda, meaning that Rodalinda came up and said, hey, I want to eat here now. And he said, OK, yes, ma'am. And he moved away because that is what a good dad does in a lemur troop. So cockerel shafak are from the northern part of Madagascar, specifically the northwestern forests, and they are what's called bipedal. So as they move, they hop on their back two legs. Oh, and you're seeing more displacement. That's just her showing she's in charge. Liz has spread out the food to give him lots of places to eat. Oh, Eustace decided to come over. So hopefully you'll see some good bouncing. There we go. So they're bipedal like we are. We walk on two feet, but unlike us, their hips are rotated out. So they actually leap from side to side with their hips rotated out so that they can grab onto trees. Now they're most graceful when they're up in the trees and they're going to be bouncing between the trees. They can leap up to 30 feet horizontally between trees but they stay vertical the whole time with their shoulders above their hips. So they're called vertical leapers and clingers. And there's three groups of lemurs that do this. It includes the family of Shafak species. It includes the Indri, the largest lemur that stands at about two to three feet tall, depending on how you measure and how big that one has grown. And then it also includes the sportive lemurs, which is a type of nocturnal lemur, a group of nocturnal lemurs, or oh, sorry, the woolly lemur was who I was trying to say. The woolly lemurs, which is a group of species in Madagascar. So after that, I think I might open it up to see if there are any questions before I continue babbling about lemurs. I am checking checking right now into the to the uh, questions, and I'll. Check and see if we have anything right now coming in. It's a good reminder though, anyone watching, if you've got questions, now would be a good time to send them up so we can make sure that we pass them on to the Duke Lemur Center. Um, 
taking a look now. My, we do have one question. How much food do you go through a day feeding all these, all these guys? Wow, that's a great question. Um, and I'm going to give you my favorite answer, which is I don't actually know. Um, so I know <laughs> that we have over 200 lemurs living here. And I know that we have three different types of biscuits. We have more, we have veggies, we have fruit, we have greens. So amongst all of those things, I don't know the exact amount of what we feed the lemurs um, and how much we go through, but it's quite a bit. And we have to order quite a bit of fresh produce and other fresh things for them. So I know it's quite a lot, but I don't know the exact amount. Well, and I have, and I have another question coming in from Laura. How many babies do they have? That's a great guess, question. Yeah. Um, and it's actually a longer answer than you would expect. So there's about 100 species of lemur. Actually, I think it's 109 species of lemur that are currently recognized in Madagascar. We have 14 different species here, so we have the most uh, diversity of lemurs outside of Madagascar in the world. So even here at the Duke Lemur Center, we have lemurs like these cockerel shafak in front of us. And actually, uh, Rotolinda here was pregnant with Eustace for about six months. It's a very long gestation period. And she has one infant at a time. And typically, she'll have about one infant a year. Um, but... And that includes uh, cycling and breeding once a year. So it's a pretty limited schedule for breeding. Um, then we have at the other end of the spectrum, uh, ruffed lemurs. So black and white ruffed lemurs or red ruffed lemurs. They're canopy dwellers that live in the rainforests in the northeastern part of Madagascar and along the eastern coast. And those lemurs are pretty rare for primates. They actually have a litter of up to six at a time. So they build nests high up in the trees since they can't carry all those babies. And then they leave the babies in the nest and park them there while they go and forage for food. They also breed only about once a year. And then we have the Aiai, my personal favorite lemur, who are nocturnal. And they actually can breed multiple times throughout the year. But they'll typically have one, maybe two infants at a time in the wild. But they also build a nest. So you've got a lot of variety between all the different types of lemurs. Um, but typically you'll see maybe one baby a year maybe two. Um, but then if you go to like the red rough lemurs or the black and white rough lemurs, you can see up to six infants a year. Well, that's great to know that there's such variety and um, different, you know, different lemurs that you, you, they all got their unique way of um, creating the next generation and their own habits as well. That's really interesting to learn. And I was, we've got another question that's come in. And I don't think you touched on this. Um, with being on the island from Madagascar, are there any threats that lemurs face, whether it be natural or otherwise? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to define this in a couple of ways. Um, I'm also going to comment on what you're seeing right now. So yeah, please um, do. you're seeing a squirrel. Yeah, there's a squirrel getting a little fresh and trying to steal some of the lemur food. Um, so you oh. might see that happen. That's about the only interaction you see with wildlife here in North Carolina. Um, you're also seeing what I think is a little bit of play behavior between mom and son, but also maybe borderline displacement. Yeah, so uh, Eustace is getting to the age where mom is not tolerating him as much. He's getting to be an adult. So you're seeing a little bit of wrestling that's like half play, half displacement, but he's being cheeky and sticking around. Um, so to answer the question, um, threats facing lemurs, uh, there are a couple of ways to look at that. So. If you're an individual lemur trying to survive, um, there are predators uh, that might come after you, mainly the fusa, which is a carnivore found only on Madagascar. They look kind of like a cross between a wildcat and something like a fox, but they're not related to either directly. They're actually most directly related to, say, like a mongoose. Um, and they're a really, really cool animal, but they can climb up in the trees and they can hunt lemurs. They live all around the edge of the island. If you're looking at threats that are not natural and part of the natural cycle of predator-prey relationships, then the largest threat far and away is habitat loss. And the main reason for that is that Madagascar is a large island with a huge population. There are about 27 million people currently living on the island. And Madagascar uh, economically is one of the poorest countries in the world. Now the people there uh, live mostly using what's called uh, tavi or slash and burn agriculture. Of course, there are people living in cities as well. There's all kinds of variety, just like there's all kinds of variety here in North America as well. 
And the biggest threat is that with all those people living on the island, most of those people are focusing on feeding their family, which is pretty much the basic goal you need in life. But in order to feed their family, they need land to be able to farm. And because of the huge population, the land is getting depleted from having to farm so rapidly and quickly. So that's why it's so important when we have lemurs like this living here in North Carolina, that it's part of an overall conservation initiative that includes working on the ground with the people of Madagascar. And it's very important to remember that conservation is only successful when it's community conservation, when we're working with the people who live there, and we're not coming in and trying to dictate what happens or assume we know what's best for the land and the people living there. So we do community-based conservation, working in things like sustainable agriculture, reforestation. There's been a huge effort in Madagascar, uh, led by the Malagasy people and the government, to reforest. Tens of thousands of trees have been planted. So it's a really amazing effort. Um, so it's really rewarding for us to get to work with those Malagasy conservationists and researchers and kind of help them achieve their goals. So again, I'm noticing that there's always a, a strong need for community involvement um, to be mm -hmm. part of any conservation work. And it's always great to hear how different organizations are working with the communities because um, we're all connected. And it's really great to hear that there's so much. We don't have any other questions coming in. So if there's you know, more to see, more to tour you want to take us on, I want to let you know you're good to get back to that. or. Uh, yeah, well, what's going on here? We've got, is it just the one now? The, is this the son or the mom? This is the son. So we just switched from mom. Mom was sitting in a not so ladylike position, so I thought I'd give her some privacy. Oh. So <laughs> we have Eustace and son sitting here, and he's snacking on his food, and he's letting me get close enough that I can show you more of his diet. So oh, you wow. might remember earlier I mentioned that the ring-tailed lemurs had that large biscuit uh, that was kind of a primate chow, but nothing else. And here you can see that the cockerel shafak have some leafy greens in there, you might have even seen them eating like sweet potato or carrot or something like that, other vegetables. So cockerel shafak are a really delicate species. They require a lot of very specific care. Earlier I mentioned that ring-tailed lemurs can kind of eat whatever. They're very generalist. They can survive on pretty much anything. Whereas cockerel shafak are quite the opposite. They're what's called a folivore. So they are primarily leaf-eating primates. And so that tiny little biscuit that Eustace is picking out and eating that is called folivore chow. So it's specifically made for leaf eating primates. And it's pretty rare that you find an animal that's this small, that's a leaf eater, because leaves are not a very efficient way of getting your energy. Usually when you see small animals, they need energy very quickly because they have fast metabolisms. And so they're gonna eat things like sugary saps, fruits, insects, things that are really high in uh, energy from calories. Leaves are not very high in energy from calories. That's why salads are a big thing people eat if they're trying to have a healthier lifestyle. And so these guys have a very, very specific digestive tract to be able to process all the nutrients they need from these leaves. And that means we have to have a very, very specific diet available for them. And cockerel shafak are actually very rarely held in human care. Uh, most other species of shafak are only found in Madagascar or in very small populations. So here at the Duke Lemur Center, we actually manage all of the cockerel shafak that are in human care worldwide. And what that means is if you see cockerel shafak at a zoo or at another facility like the Duke Lemur Center, we're all part of a big network and we're all making sure that these lemurs are as healthy as possible and that they are breeding with the right partners so we have a healthy genetic future for them. So that while we're working in the wild in Madagascar to protect their habitat and to reinstate their habitat, we're also protecting a genetic safety net here in case we get to a point one day where we actually have enough space in the wild where there's a need for more lemurs living there. I'm gonna preempt the question that probably is popping up for folks uh, because most people think of conservation as including uh, release programs. We're putting animals back out into the wild and those can be wonderful. There's been a lot of great examples of that and how zoos have contributed to that with say the black-footed ferrets in uh, Central North America or the California condor. But those are really specific circumstances where there was a low population, but there was enough habitat and resources to support a larger population. We have the opposite problem going on in Madagascar, where you don't have enough habitat and you don't have enough resources for the lemurs already living there. So unless we work to solve those problems with the Malagasy people and conservationists in the next few decades, 
there's really not any helpful thing that occurs when you release lemurs back out into the wild. In fact, you would probably lower the overall carrying capacity of that environment, which some folks might be familiar. That's basically the number of lemurs that can live in any given environment, given all of the factors that they need, like sources for food and water and availability of space for them to roam around and not be in conflict with each other. So it's surprising for some people sometimes to hear that conservation gets a lot more complicated than just releasing animals back out into the wild, since there's a lot of factors that might prevent those animals from living there to start with. That is really surprising to hear. You definitely think of uh, programs like your your you have here that are all about creating, you know, and get enabling animals to be released into the wild. So it's interesting that that's unfortunately not the the plan. Um, with that, I I, was, I have a question. I'm curious about do how do each group of lemurs that you're taking care of fit in with their larger conservation story? Because it sounds like the if there's more of them in cat in captivity, how does that help the overall population of lemurs in general? So that's an interesting question and it depends a little on the species. So for example, a cockroach or fox, fox here, um, like Eustace right here, there are far more of them living in the wild than there are living here in, in human care uh, in North America. Um, but animals like the ring-tailed lemur there's still likely more of them in the wild, although population surveys are a very hard thing to do. I'm sure <laughs> that was very graceful, Eustace. Um, so I'm sure um, that some of the uh, people you have during your festival might be talking about that because it's very difficult to calculate how many animals live in the wild accurately. Um, but there's a lot of ring-tailed lemurs all across North America. So there's kind of two ways that the animals we have here in our captive population um, relate to the animals that are living in the wild. And one is that genetic safety net that I mentioned, which is yep. for lemurs that are getting fewer and fewer in the wild with habitat that is disappearing. There are cases sometimes where habitat disappears enough that you wind up only having the animal in human care, in captivity, and not living in the wild. Uh, for example, that happened with red bulls here in North Carolina and along the east coast of uh, North America. Um, and they actually were able to release re-release them back out into the wild and begin a population of red wolves on our east coast here again. Um, what happens more often is that you keep that genetic safety net and you work really hard to preserve the habitat and eventually you might get to a place where you can release some of the animals back out into the wild. The other relationship these animals have with their wild counterparts and helping their wild counterparts is that they serve as ambassadors to teach people about the animals. So. We all care deeply about the environment. That's why we're participating in this uh, festival and, and joining in. Um, but the only way we can do that is if we know about these animals, if we've seen them, if we've learned about them. And the bonus for animals like Eustace here is that a lot of the lemurs live pretty easy lives here compared to living in the wild. No predators to worry about, all their food is taken care of, and there are events on them. I think we, we may have lost a little bit of your audio, um, broken up a little bit there. Oh. Can you still hear? Oh, no, maybe, maybe okay. we're okay, Megan. Okay, yeah, I was just mentioning that Eustace has a pretty easy life here compared to in the wild, so he doesn't seem to mind having uh, his food delivered every morning and vets on call. So since he, he's of the, almost sounds like he's trend, you know about to become an adult and maybe, um, you know, next stage of his life, what what happens with him in the, the relationship with his uh, his members of his family um, as he matures? Absolutely. So as he matures, he's actually going to probably stop getting along so well with mom and dad. Um, I like to argue that you can see remnants of this in humans, too, as we hit our adolescence. Sometimes we butt heads with our authority figures, too. And the same thing can happen with lemurs. And that's him basically Growing up, starting to assert his independence, he's naturally going to have more hormones going through his body. Those levels are changing, and he's going to be starting to think about finding a breeding partner and having babies of his own. And in some animals, like, say, elephants, you'll have multiple generations all living together in one large family group. In most species of lemur, like the cockerel shafak here, you're going to see one small nuclear family group, and then as the kids age out of that group, they're going to move off naturally on their own. In the wild, that means moving off and kind of hooking up with satellite groups of lemurs 
usually they've been smelling each other's scent markings and they might have smelled that another adolescent female might be leaving their troop and they'll kind of find each other and start their own troop. Here at the lemur center, obviously, we have fences that enclose them into where they're supposed to be, keep them in their forest habitats. So we just keep a very, very close eye. And Liz comes out here and she sees if they're starting to not get along as well, if Eustace isn't being allowed to eat with the family as closely as he was this morning, if maybe he's starting to challenge mom and dad a little too much. Liz knows these guys really well, so do all of their other caretakers, and they'll watch out for that. And we'll have a plan, even since Eustace was born, there's a plan that looks at who's his best match. And that might be his best match, best match based on a stud book. Literally, just like horse racing, there's a stud book for each species. And all of the captive animals across North America, we know who their parents are, how they're related, how they're not related. And so they'll be paired based on that stud book to have the best genetic health. And then if they're not chosen to breed with another lemur, then we'll pair them with someone else for companionship. And that might mean Eustace stays here and he joins up with a female from another troop that's hitting the right age. Or it might mean he moves to another zoo or even that a female from another zoo comes to live here and stay with Eustace um, so that we can pair them up properly. So sometimes we do transport lemurs across the US and sometimes even internationally to make sure they have uh, somebody to spend time with at the very least, if not a breeding partner to keep that genetic safety net. That is really interesting to think that, you know, there's that network and, you know, knowledge that you can connect lemurs with diff lemurs in different zoos and all around North mm -hmm. America. It's a little bit like uh, your your matchmaker for the for the lemurs. <laughs> Absolutely, and there've been some really cute campaigns on social media. I think particularly with uh, hippos, um, where they've actually posted almost like a dating profile, but it doesn't quite work like that. It's more based on genetics than anything else. Although I will say, the lemurs have a choice. If we try to introduce them, no matter how far that lemur has shipped from across the U.S., if they really don't want to get along and they're not going to be happy together, well, we're going to have to find a new match. Well, that is also great to know that, you know, there's there's kind of a, a guarantee that if, you, if we don't find your match, we're, we're going to do some work to get you, make sure you're happy. Um, yeah. And it's 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 a great way to think about how you really are focused on making sure that they have the best possible conditions to live in, um, even when it comes to finding a potential match. So yeah. we are almost out of time, Megan. So I wanted to mm -hmm. see if we could see your your the mask all again. Uh, one last time, remind everyone that if they are, you know, want to support uh, the Duke Lemur Center, that there's masks that are potentially available that they can buy with the uh, great lemurs on them. And of course, say thank you to Megan for taking us around, telling us so much about lemurs and giving us a great peek into their the lemur center. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you everyone for joining me. Please check us out online. We have lots of virtual programs, of course, masks and other things and other ways to support, but we'd love to teach you more about lemurs and we hope you'll join us sometime. And there, just to make sure everyone can see it before we go, uh, lemur.duke.edu. So you can check out more about the lemur sanctuary and maybe get that great mask if you're interested in it. So thank you again, Megan. Really appreciate it. Hope you have a great rest of the day with the lemurs. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.